Testing. Can we hear it? Yep. Right. Right. Thank you for coming today. Um, thank God for bringing all us here together under Christ, under this roof, that we may worship freely. Well, today I want to talk about something I think that is obscure from the Christian perspective, and I think very obscure for a very simple reason, and that is simply because we don't live in it. If you grow up a Christian, like I do, the notion of sacrifice, animal sacrifices, going through the rites and rituals, it's something that the Gentiles do, it's something that pagans around you do, it's not something that you Christians do. And in the context of the New Testament, if we look at the cultures of the New Testament, the Greeks conduct the sacrifices, the Romans conduct the sacrifices, even gladiatorial sports initially was a form of human sacrifice for the Romans in the first place. And if we look, even the barbarians around them conducted sacrifices. So sacrifice is this constant and this continual constant both for the Jews and the Gentiles in that ancient world. And it's a context that seems very divorced from Christian, from, from Christian cultures, because if you were born in a Christian society, let's say America, for example, I think the notion of sacrifice is something, something to appease the God, God or the gods sounds positively ludicrous, just intuitively ludicrous if you are born in a Christian society. But if we look at the societies such as the one Singapore is located in, one where the Gentiles are still dominant, I think if you reflect on it carefully, you still see examples of the sacrifices happening around you, especially if you have family members who are not Christian. For example, the burning of incense to appease the ancestors, the burning of hell money. If you look at the Muslims around, the sacrifice of goats. The sacrifice of goats. In fact, there's this infamous story from 2000 and there's this infamous story from the year 2016, where there was this Pakistani airline that in response to an air crash decided to sacrifice a black goat to Allah so that the, plane would not, so that the next plane would not crash. And it provoked a lot of ridicule and apologetics in Pakistan itself. But the point I want to put forth here is this, is this. While sacrifice is something that has been expunged from most Christian societies, the form of sacri sacred sacrifice that atones for sin, that reconciles with God, that gets something from the God to you, that thing doesn't exist. It is something that I think is still real and alive in many parts of Singaporean society today. But it's something that if you grow up within a church, you only see secondhand and you see as something as, something as laughable and ridiculous. And so, my first reaction, and I must confess, when I first read Hebrews 10, years ago as a teenager, was, what Paul is saying is extremely obvious. It's so obvious that I cannot imagine why he's saying this in the first place. And that's because you don't have the perspective to sympathize. I think that's, you don't have the perspective to sympathize and empathize with the Gentiles around you. You do not have that kind of perspective of the rites and practices of the rituals around you. Because you are born in a Christian bubble, you avoid all these rituals and practices that have nothing to do with you, not your business, don't care about them. And I think that's, I think that's actually, but, if, but I think as, you grow, as I grow older, I realize that I live in this kind of world, that we live in this world where there's this human instinct to sacrifice. And the Jews really did this in extreme vivid picture. Because if you read at Leviticus 4, 3, 10, right? Let's look at how vivid sacrifice is. When the high priest sins, he makes everyone guilty, else guilty too. And so he must sacrifice a young bull that has nothing wrong with it. So what do we do? We go to we go and shop for the nearest bull to buy the most the most the healthiest bull you can find with no defects. The priest will lead the bull to the entrance of the sacred tent, lay his hands over his head, and kill it there. He will take a bowl of blood inside the tent, dip a finger in the blood, and sprinkle it seven times towards the sacred chest behind the curtain. So picture this, right? Picture this. Picture this as an altar behind me and a priest, and every single time. A high priest who tries to appropriate for the sins of his congregation. He takes a blood of goat, slaughters a goat, and dips the altar right behind, right behind the baptismal pool. That is, that, that is the equivalent of what the Jew, what the Jews take as as for granted. What Paul's audience in Hebrews takes for as granted, and what even the pagans that Paul preached to take for as granted. 
Then, in my presence, he will smear some of this blood with the four corners of the incense altar before pouring the rest at the foot of the bronze altar near the entrance of the tent. So it's very messy business, right? The visceral everywhere, the red tent, there's a scent of blood. It's not very nice, it's not very clean. It's very gory, very deliberate. If, in fact, we can even call it dramatic. And the priest will remove the fat from the bull, and just as he does when he sacrifices the, the bull to ask my blessings. This includes the fat of the insides as well as the lower parts of the liver and two kidneys with their fat. He will then send it all up in smoke. And if you ever clean a fish of intestines or clean a chicken of intestines before, you know this is probably a very icky process. <laughs> you know, your, your hands are literally soaked in the intestine fluids and <laughs> blood and who knows what else. And you're going to throw it into the fire and you're, going to, and you're basically going to make sure that it's going to set up in smoke. And that smell is probably not very pleasant, let's be honest with it. But that's the way it is. That's the way it is for the Jews. And that is the way it is for the Greeks. That was the way it is for the pagans. That was it for the Celts. That was it for the Aztecs. For any number of you, that was even for the way it is for the Chinese in the first place and the Indians in the first place and the Arabs in the first place. That is the way of the logic of men. Because I think if you ask a Christian this rhetorical question, when was the last time you have sacrificed atonement, the majority of the congregation, the majority of a Christian audience will give you blank stares. What do you mean sacrifice of atonement? We can't sacrifice of atonement. That's impossible. Men cannot offer God in anything except their hearts, except their sincere and honest hearts and their repentance for the sacrifice, of, for Christ's ultimate sacrifice. So, and that's not how the way the logic of man works, right? So the, lo the logic of man basically is, it's intuitively obvious that if you want God to do something for you, such as to forgive you, you have to sacrifice something to God. You have to give up something to God. And you do so some, through some ritual that is commanded to God in some exact, meticulous detail. And if you deviate from that detail just a bit, you read the Old Testament how many times. For example, the sons of Samuel were smited before, before they, because, they, because they deviated from the details of ritual sacrifice. So it's serious business. The logic of man is, that, is, is basically man sacrifices to God. But what I want to talk about here today is something that I think is revolutionary from this perspective. And what Paul is saying may sound very obvious to us today, but we have to understand that at the time that Paul was writing to the audience, the audience of Hebrews would have seen what Paul was saying as revolutionary. Because the logic of man is man sacrifices to God. What is the logic of Christ? God sacrifices for man. Amen? And that is the... And that's upside down, isn't it? If you think of it, that, 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 is revert, that, that is basically the whole logic of sacrifice flipped on his head, sacrifice inverted on his head. Which is why I call my sermon today sacrifice inverted because that is what basically Paul is preaching. The rules that you are familiar with, that you have lived with, that you've grown up with, guess what? They better not the Christ. Christ by dying on the cross, has inverted and flipped the rules upside down. Now, instead of we sacrificing to God, God instead sacrifices to him for, for us once and for all. And why does he do it? Because he loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And because he loved, that this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so the logic of sacrifice is the logic of sacrifice is reversed again on another level, and that is on the level of love. Humanity, humans typically express their love to the gods of God by sacrificing for God. But the revolutionary aspect of Christ is the other way around. Humans cannot satisfy God with any of their sacrifices. Rather, God loves humanity, loves the world so much that his son is sent down as that atoning ultimate sacrifice once and for all, for all our sins. Because he loved us, not because we love him first, because he loved us first. And all we have to do is to have that humility and contriteness to accept. And presumably most of us, all of us who have baptized in the faith so far have, have made that decision, have made a decision on one level or the other to accept the humility to to. Humil that, that humility. But I sometimes wonder, actually, from someone who is raised a Christian, whether how much of humility there is if you're already born believing that the sacrifice is ultimately paid. Because 
when you baptize, you are baptizing over things that you think are self-evident and obvious. You grow up in. The, if you grow up, one of the most popular, one of the most popular songs we you teach in Bible class is "Jesus Loves Me, This I Know," and it's something that you internalize completely. So the idea that God loves you so much that He is willing to die on the cross for all humanity doesn't sound very far fetched if you were raised a Christian. I cannot speak for non-believers, but I will assume for many non-believers and for people who have experienced converting away from that state, the idea that Christ dies on the cross for you is quite far-fetched. That Christ, if Christ, God, who is God the Son, chooses to sacrifice his own, his own self, his own divine self on the cross, that sounds bizarre. And Paul goes into very deep detail analyzing the illogical sacrifice. And I think it's worth walking through that logic a bit, right? So let me begin with verse 1. The law is only a shadow of things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who are drawn near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would not have felt guilty for their sins. But those sins are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood and boo of God, of goat, boos and goats to take away sins. This logic is radical for a Jew. This logic is very radical for a Jew, 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 to be honest, because you're basically saying that all the sacrifices conducted in the Levitical system, well, guess what? They didn't do anything to reconcile you with God. They did nothing to atone you for your sins. And of course, for a Christian, you read this verse and you think, it's obvious. How can an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, all-loving God, how can it be satisfied with just the blood of bulls and animals when we sin, and we sin because we fall short of the love that He demands that we show each other? You can't. Because the blood, because the bull, and you can't, I think for a host of reasons. Firstly, the bull and the blood of the bull is not the same nature of the one who sins. It's man who sins, not the bull. So the bull is a substitution, but why should this substitution be satisfactory for omnipotent God? Especially when such, such substitution doesn't probably bring about any form of transformation and does not allow you to reflect on the behavior. That's not, it's not one the way you repent and where you resolve to not just forgive your brother, not just make amends for your brother, which is why Christ says in the Gospels, if you, have, if you brought the sacrifice and you anything, I'll stand and grudge your body, I'll stand and grudge your body, you go and forgive him. It's not just it's not just that, it's not just that. It doesn't bring about true, genuine transformation. It doesn't bring about a change in behavior. Because you sacrifice animal, you go back, you sin again, you sacrifice animal again. It goes on again and again like a hamster wheel that spins for eternity. And it's this hamster wheel of eternal of eternal sacrifice of sin and sacrifice again and again and again that the Jews are trapped in. And it's a tragic hamster wheel if you think about it. It's one that, if you stop thinking of it, it's really pitiful. It's a pitiful condition. The second is that uh, blood and goo, blood, the, the blood of the boo does not have enough value to bridge the gap between God and man. The gap that's opened up because of sin. Sin is so abhorrent in the eyes of omniscient God that the blood of booze is for not is the blood of booze does nothing to really elevate to elevate sin. The third reason is that the beasts themselves do not consent. Obviously, the beasts cannot consent. You're dragging this beast unwillingly to the altar to be slaughtered. <laughs> he, he, did, he, he, he didn't volunteer to be slaughtered. How awfully convenient. And the fourth problem, I think, is a very danger, is very damaging problem. Because we call Leviticus, right? In the high priest sins, he has the sacrifice of bulls. But wait a moment. If we believe, as the Bible proclaims, that all men are sinful, if all men are fundamentally sinful, then this high priest is going to sin again and again and again. And odds are, in between, his in between the sacrifice of one bull and the next, he's probably going to sin in ways he doesn't realize. Because he may, for all you know, end up calling his fellow brother a fool out of exasperation, and that itself is, according to the Beatitudes, enough to condemn you in the fire. So is he supposed to go back after calling his brother a fool and sacrifice a bull again? Well, the law dictates that, but in practice, of course, we probably know it doesn't work that way. So clearly, the one who makes a sacrifice is a man. He is sinful, and if he is sinful, and if the other Jewish law, sinfulness invalidates the sacrifice, then there is a sinful man whose sacrifice to clear sinfulness has not been renewed, who is sacrificing on behalf. 
And, then, then, and if that's the case, the whole sacrificial system basically falls in on themselves. I also want to put forth another point, and another interesting distinction, right? For the Jews and for Christians, we both agree what is most important when we do with, with the act of sacrifice is the act of atonement or reconciliation with God. I think this is something that is not controversial, theologically speaking. And Paul would put forth that what sacrifice actually does, your human sacrifices does, is that it's a reminder, it's not atonement. I think it's an important distinction to make, right? Because the idea of reminding you of your sins is so that you may feel guilty, and hopefully if you feel guilty, your conscience pricks you and you resolve to do better next time, which you won't. Spoiler alert, you won't. But that's not atonement, where your sins are truly cleansed. Because your guilty conscience is still there. The record is still there between you and God. That grudge is still there between you and God. That wrong is still there between you and God, between you and, you and your fellow men. And I think that there are people who would say, if you give, even in the Christian faith, if you give, it's a form of sacrifice to God. No, it's not a form of sacrifice to God. I think I would say that under this logic, we have to realize that when you do your givings, when you ever you resolve to change your life, to embrace God, to make the sacrifice, to make the kind of sacrifices in your life, to live a Christian life, you are the sacrifice. You are doing this because of your hope for atonement. Your atonement is there. You are doing this because you have been a transformed fundamentally by the Spirit, moved by the Spirit. But B, you do this because you remind yourself of your relationship between God, between God and you. It doesn't establish the relationship, it doesn't maintain the relationship, but it puts it in the focus and perspective. I think that is the, I think that, I think, I think, I think that's the, I, I think that's the idea here. And if we look right, he, Paul goes on to quote Hebrews 5 to 7, which comes from Psalms 46 to 8. And it basically reads, Sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not require. Then I have said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in this, in this cross. I desire to do your will, my God, your law is within my heart. And it's a rich verse. It's a, it's a very rich and thick verse because there are two things going on here, right? So I've come, what God wants, what God really wants. Even the psalmist recognized that what God really wanted was not your sacrifice and burnt offerings. What God really wanted was your heart. And not your physical heart, but rather your heart to do the will of God. And we know what the will of God is. I don't think we need much reminder of it. It is basically to love Him with all your heart and all your mind, so and love your neighbor as to love yourself. But that's what God commands. And more interestingly, right, some people would say, well, isn't Paul quoting Psalms 40 out of context? No, because Psalms 40 actually is about the salvation, about the power of God as the Savior. So Hebrews 10 is actually quoting Psalms 40 within the context of salvation. So if we look at Psalms 40, 12, for example, we get words like, for troubles without numbers surround me, my sins have overtaken me, I cannot see. There is more hair in my head. And my heart fails, and my heart fails me. Then he goes on about how God saves him from all of his adversaries and troubles. And that's the theme of Psalm 40. So I think in a way there are many adversaries here. And you're not just talking about physical adversaries, we're talking about the great eternal enemy, the adversary, the tempter, the devil, and the great adversary that is sin, and that is our own sinful nature. And I think that itself is also just as much adversary as that is just as valid adversary in the perspective of Psalms as it is in Hebrews. So Paul goes down further, right? First he said, Sacrifice and burnt offerings, and burnt offerings you do not desire, nor will you please with them, though they were offered in accordance to the law. Then he says, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ, once and for all. And of course, it begs the question, it begs the question of this analysis, right? Um, if 
if it is true that God does not desire, nor is pleased to sacrifice and burnt offerings, sacrifice and burnt offerings, what is he, what does he desire? Well, if we look at the scriptures, the first is obedience, first Samuel fifteen twenty two. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the f- than the fat of rams. And what then is obedience? What then does God desire? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Hosea 6.6 6. And what is mercy? Well, we go back to the Gentiles. How many times must I, must I forgive my brother? Seven times, seven times, seven times, right? And every time we forgive our brother, we are showing and extending mercy to our brother. Every time we take our enemies, we, we, we give our enemies water, we show mercy to them. The parable of the, great Samar- of, of the good Samaritan was the Samaritan showing mercy on the poor traveler who was assaulted and left for dead by the roadside. I'd say that it puts forth one aspect of love, of loving one another, and that is that we show forbearance with one another, with the flaws and frictions we have with one another, that we lay aside these frictions we have with one another, we lay aside grudges and resentment we have with one another, to reconcile with each other, for we are all children under God. Which is why it is said in 1 John 4, 11, Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love each other. And that is the acknowledgement of God, right? Because if God is love, and if God desires acknowledgement, and if you acknowledge that God is love, then you also acknowledge that God demands that you love too. And therefore, by obeying God and by practicing love, you acknowledge God. And from there, from this basic foundation of sacrifice once and for all, from there stems the idea of love. And, but here's the, here's, the, the, here's the warning that I would put forth. One could read this to argue that you could be redeemed just by loving one another. And in theory, if you were a perfect being who could perfectly love one another, you would have to be God. Because you are human. And there lies the trap. Your love for one another without Christ and in itself is insufficient to be redeemed for redemption. Because if God's love is infinite and our capacity to love is finite, then how can we match up to infinite God's infinite capacity to love? We can't. But it gets worse because our capacity to love is not perfect either. And Romans 7, 18, 7, 18 to 20 captures this very firmly. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that my sinful nature... For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin who lives in me, living in me, who does it. And that is, I think, the fundamental problem. That is the fundamental problem. God desires obedience, no sacrifice. If sacrifice and burnt offerings are out as a route back to God. And if obedience cannot be perfected because of our fundamental flaws as sinful humans, what then? And this comes to Paul's conclusion, right? And it's a beautiful conclusion. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duty. It's an eternal hamster wheel. Again, you're spinning and spinning and spinning the hamster wheel to no avail. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when the priest, this priest, that is Christ, has offered once and for all one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who have been made holy. And so, who breaks the hamster wheel? The hamster wheel is the chain by which we humanity is, con- is condemned to basically eternally run a rat race where we can never be reconciled with God. And there lies his response. He gave his only son to die on the cross as atonement for sin. 
He gave it on several levels. I think, firstly, we believe that sin needs restitution, right? I think all humans agree. Well, I think it's, intu it's intuition that all sin requires some restitution in some way. I think the second level is that we humans ourselves cannot really accept the idea of our sins being forgiven unilaterally by God without some kind of sacrifice being taken place. Because if you recall, in the Gospels, Christ himself comes down, heals the sick, heals the wounded. He tells them, your sins have been forgiven. And what do the Jews, who are closest to God, respond? Who are you to forgive others of your sins? So we come to a final and grander, the, the grandest aversion himself, Christ the High Priest. The High Priest usually is the one doing the sacrifice. He's not the one being sacrificed. Christ, however, says, I will show you a more perfect way I will sacrifice myself, present myself as that sacrifice. I will not be the one doing that sacrifice because no sacrifice I do will ever be valid except the sacrifice of myself, of my own divine, perfect self who is both God and who is man. And this sacrifice is valid because I am a man approaching God. But at the same time, I'm also God who is man, who is the son of man. And therein we see, right, therein we see the hamster wheel can only be broken by a person with two qualifications. One, he's perfect like God and therefore is God. And two, he is also a man who is a qualifies as high priest, who, who therefore can serve as high priest, the reconciled as man of God. And so this is the work around. I think this is why it is, and I think for many of us, we think that the triune nature of God is something that is abstract. But I would like to put forth here that actually when we think about the logic behind our salvation and what we claim, the reason why we Christians do not right now go to sacrifice goats for our next flight out, for the grace of God for our next flight out, the reason why we don't do this is because we believe that Christ is both God and man, and we believe in that revolutionary system of sacrifice where God sacrifices himself for man, and man responds by accepting the sacrifice and, if, and accepting the grace and salvation of God to be reconciled by God. Which is why God the Son becomes the ultimate sacrifice that ends all sacrifices. And it's why we don't go through Levitical systems. That's why we don't go through all the other sacrificial methods of the Gentiles around us, Gentiles around all the implications. Think the hungry ghost month, for example, where people burn paper money to appease, and to appease ghosts. We don't do that. We don't live in this era. We do not sacrifice goats every, every single Ramadan to be reconciled with Allah. We don't do that. And you know what? That is the freedom that we enjoy, to go before God and say, Abba, Father, forgive us for our sins, that we, that, that we may be loving with one another, that we may love our neighbors and love ourselves, that we may show your light to this world. And we say this without any form of sacrifice whatsoever, because the one who sits at the right hand of God, who is in the seats for us, for him, has the one who has sacrificed himself once and for all to give us the right to go to God and to ask this of God. And this is the great freedom that we've had. I think that is a freedom that is something that I will confess that I live in all my life and therefore, if you are born free, it is hard to know what it's like to be a slave. But I can on an intellectual level grasp how wondrous it is, how different it is, how radical it is. And this is why we call the gospel the good news. This is the good news of Christ that he loved you so much that he reversed the system of sacrifice, turned it on his head upside down, and sacrificed himself on the cross that you may be reconciled to him. That you may be atoned once and for all if you accept his sacrifice. And it's a wondrous thing, is it not? Hallelujah. Amen. So we end in 15 and 18, and, is, this is, this is, and I think it talks about something very practical about it. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in, comes in here. The Holy Spirit, who testifies to us about this, Percy says, this is the covenant I make with them. After the time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their heart, and I will write it in their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And when this has been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. 
which is presaged by the food tax. The day is coming, declares the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the peoples of Israel and with the peoples of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I have made with their ancestors when I took them by their head to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is a covenant I will make with the people of Israel after the time. I will put my law in their minds and write in their hearts, I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to each other, Know the Lord, because they will know me, all know me, from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And what is the qualification here? That the law is in your minds and written on your hearts. And how is the law written on your minds and our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I think that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, right? The Holy Spirit accompanies us because for that sacrifice to be served, to be kept in place, the law must be written in our hearts and our minds. And it's written in our hearts and minds by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who drives us towards righteousness. If we listen to the Spirit and allow it to move us, And from here, we see the necessity of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, right, I think that in those 13 verses, we see something important about the nature of the of new covenant. The foundation is basically the ultimate sacrifice of God, of, of God for man because of love. The sacrifice of admission is repent, confess, and be baptized. The nature that underpins this covenant is that of love, unconditional agape love. Why was this new covenant necessary? Because even the chosen people who knew and grew up with the law were unfaithful to the old covenant. As much as they tried, the laws could not be written in their hearts, for they were astray. Even, even when they forsook, for, forsaken, forsook many of the unrighteous practices ancestors, the worship of idols in the time of Levites, even then Christ came down to the generation of Pharisees and Sadducees, all of whom were definitely not idolaters, guilty of the same sins of the Father, and pointed out to them that even then you were still sinful. You are still incomplete. You are still hypocrites. You say that whatever is korban, korban I give. You say to your fathers, fathers and mothers, whatever, whatever I have to give for you is korban, you hypocrites, you fools. You put your burnt sacrifice and offering on the table, but I tell you that God does not accept those burnt offerings because your heart is not right with your brother. And so the old covenant failed. It failed even when the most dangerous deviation from it, that is the inability to commit to God, that is idolatry in the heart, even that, when that was removed, it still failed. So the effect, therefore, is that the law is written in our hearts and the mind via the indwelling Holy Spirit. And in the end, it produces the fruits of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So I'm going to end with three closing thoughts. Works are not the price of admission. You cannot, through giving, no agape love, nor through witnessing, no forgiveness, you cannot bring admission this con in this covenant, this covenant of ultimate once and for atonement of God and man. They aren't the price of entry to covenant. They are the result of the covenant if you allow, if the, you cultivate and dwelling of spirit in you. Number two. It is for the reason of this ultimate sacrifice that all systems of sacrifice are rendered meaningless to us Christians. You know, I used to have this phobia of going to and looking at pagan rites, but I think as I hopefully mature in my faith, I increasingly think to, to myself that all the rites of the pagans around us are but noise in the wind. They have zero meaning or consequences of Christians because we are because their whole notion of sacrifice is completely alien to our notion of sacrifice, which basically inverts the God-man relationship. On his head. And because we're protected on a new covenant, I think that many of the acts of idolatry around us, while they should be objectionable to us as Christians, is not something that I think is something that is actively harmful to us so long as we remain faithful to the covenant because it has no power over us.
And finally, I'd like to add with this. Praise be to the God Almighty, because from Him and through Him, we live in freedom from the law and the sacrifices. And we are bound in love forever and ever, even unto the end of this world, through eternity and beyond. Amen. Thank you.